Hey, it's John and Mike for Dashshoots.com, and sometimes we get viewer mail. And someone posed us a question a while back asking, hey, could you do a video on what a malt spec sheet tells you? <laughs> and how should I use that if I have one in front of me like this one? In you know, understanding what it's saying and how I should apply that information to my brew session. So I tasked Mike uh, because a lot of this is scientific oh, science. science. <laughs> so um, he's going to take us through. Uh, I think we're looking at one from Breeze Malt. Yep. Um, and this is for their uh, Brewer's Malt, one of their uh, base malts, I'm guessing. Um, so I'm ge would you say that? Spec sheets go with any malt type, so it doesn't have to be base malt. Every be... lot of malt produced by any supplier has a certificate of, of analysis. Nice. This is not a certificate of analysis, but... It's a product information sheet? It's a product sheet? information okay. sheet, and I'll explain that in a bit. Okay, so let's talk about uh, if I were looking up malts and I wanted to learn more about them, what can I glean from this product information sheet? Practically nothing. <laughs> oh, God. No, right. seriously, seriously. Okay. As a home brewer... Like these, there are certain luminaries who have talked about these things in the homebrewing world, but um, the information provided on this sh on this type of sheet, okay, um, ninety eight percent of it is relatively meaningless to the homebrewer. These sheets are made to um, to uh, relay information to uh, industrialized mega breweries okay. that are interested in one thing. Uh, efficiency, yeah, and not just not not like your mash efficiency or brew house efficiency, but total efficiency, where a shift of one or two percent could mean hundreds of thousands of dollars in production costs. But for the home brewer, that might equate to fifty cents for you. So so it it just most of this stuff is unimportant, but it is interesting to look at it to understand a little bit about your malt and where what these numbers mean, so you can be conversant in the ways of, of malt. We talk a lot about hops, humulones, cohumulones, and all that sure. jazz, but so you should really know something about malt. Yep. I will point out on the sheet the one thing that you you can use as a home brewer, but let's go through it. So yep. there's two things in the world. Another reason why these sheets are really not something to concern yourself with as a home brewer is that we're looking at a product information sheet which has a lot of the, the same data that a C of A, a certificate of analysis would have. Mm -hmm. But your local homebrew shop is opening up sacks upon sacks of malt. Maybe they're all from the same lot. Maybe they're not. When the grain bin gets low, they pour the next sack in. So it's starting to mix a little bit. Sure. Okay. Um, and more importantly, to really make use of this information, you need the, the C of A for the lot of malt that you have. And most of the time, the homebrew shop doesn't have that. It's not that they can't get it, they just don't, it doesn't come like in every sack. <laughs> yeah. They have to seek it out, like when they ordered it. Again, we're talking about silos of grain and that's when it becomes important. So, um, but this has a lot of the important terminology and the numbers on it that you would see in, a, in another, um, in a C of A. You can get your C of A's, but you have to match it up with the grain you're using. So. Yeah. So let's just start. So what I pulled down was a um, Brewer's Malt from Brees, which I really like Brewer's Malt. It's just a pretty standard American two-row malt. Um, let's just look at, so typical analysis. Yep. So words, terms like mealy, half, and glassy, there's three different percentages there. Um, that refers to really how much of the kernel, each individual kernel has been malted. Mm. And in, in the whole lot, what would you expect the distribution to be? So um, mealy is what you want. Mealy is malted barley. If you've ever seen like white rice, white rice, if you just really look at it, it's very hard to chew. It's very hard. It's and it's cooked. sort yeah, of so, shiny. Yeah. It's, it, so that is what glassy means. Got it. Uh, unmalted barley is glassy. So in this particular sheet, it's 100% zero and zero, which is pretty unusual. Um, <laughs> the other thing you need to realize too is even getting these sheets lot to lot to lot, the variation is going to be so minor because mm. they work really hard at satisfying the mega industrial breweries. They can't have a 5% shift in the extract 
Otherwise, the breweries would, you know, they would have to really retool the way they do certain things, right? So, uh, plump is also a measure of the quality of the kernels. Are they all intact? Are they large and full? Is it all the starch granule in the thing? So, 80% of these granules on this sheet are listed as plump, and it's actually a measure. They actually, when they're sifting, huh. how many of the, what percent of the granules? Fall through. There's or? four different <clears throat> layers of sifting, and a very small percentage of it goes through smaller and smaller holes. The rest of it, it's like seven sixty fourths and five sixty fourths or something is everything that's contained in those two sieves is eighty percent of it. So the rest of it might be if that number gets higher, it means it's some broken stuff like that, things like that, which you don't want. Um, the next number that's important here is this number called moisture. And so this is four point two percent. Why is moisture important? If moisture goes up, right, by ten percent. So mm -hmm. this is four percent. If that was to go up by ten percent and then be four point this is 4.2, 4.6%. That doesn't really mean much to you and me, but a 10% shift in moisture means if you weigh 10 pounds and there's a 10% shift in moisture, you've actually only got nine pounds of what it was before it picked up that moisture, mm. right? So <laughs> right. you can see now how pretty quickly that becomes an issue yep. at the big guys. Sure. Um, so um, then there's these other two things, extract, dry basis, well, FG, which is fine grind, and CG, which is coarse grind. Those are industry standards for the fine grind is when they make it into flour. And the extract for this is at 81% for fine grind and 80% for coarse grind, dry basis, which means they really dry it out. They take that 4% out. So when <laughs> you see dry basis, that 4% moisture, they just heat it until it's really super dry. Um, what those numbers represent is the total expected extract that you could get from a super fine floury crush. Even a coarse grind by the, the scientific standard used here is more fine than what you would expect to see in any brewery, home brewery or professional brewery. It's even finer than that. But, um, but from a, a, it's just a long-standing analytical tool. What's really interesting, so, and this is the place where as a home brewer, you can get some useful information, but you have to understand what this number is. So this is 80%. Uh, what that 80% of what? 80% mm -hmm. is refers to how extract being sugar and water. That's in comparison to one pound of, of sucrose okay. in a gallon of water yields a specific gravity of 1047. Okay. That's a given, yeah. right? And so, this, so brewers, uh, professional brewers, large scale breweries, 80, they work in, they don't work in specific gravity, they work in degrees Plato. And so this number means something to them. But to convert it for our sake, if you take uh, 80% of 47, so 47 is 100%. So yeah. 1.047 is a specific gravity. We can talk about it as 47 pppg points per pounds per gallon mm -hmm. one pound of sugar in one gallon of water yields you 47 points that's and we have a blog post from yes, yes. like a long time it's ago that explains pppg yeah um if you take 80 percent of 47 you get around a number that's about 36.6 yeah which is usually the standard ppg given for Malt, this right? Malt, yeah. And so this number is important. If you want to, if you really want to be super specific in your recipe formulation, um, for like this here is base malt, but that dry basis, coarse grind or fine grind might be slightly different for say unmalted wheat or flaked barley or crystal eighty things mm -hmm. like that. That number would shift a little bit. So that's where those numbers. When you look in your favorite brewing software, <laughs> and it's it, how does it calculate gravity? Well, it's a, it's put in there. 1047 for sugar, it's put in 1033 for say black patent, 1036 for brewer's malt. That's where it comes from. It's 80% of, of the standard, which is sucrose sugar, is 1036. So that's, wow. what that, so that's the most useful number to you. If that number shifts around, that's, um, you know, then you can adjust for your gravity. Yeah. That's yeah. what you're expecting to get. So more or less. You yeah. still have to adjust that number for your yeah. extraction efficiency, which yeah. might be 70% yes. of 36 points per pound per, per gallon, gallon. okay? <laughs> um, protein is just a measure of how much protein in there is. And between 12% um, and 8%, I think, is the norm. This is coming in at 11%. S over T is a ratio of soluble protein 
to total protein. Hmm. And more importantly, what that, what that number, so this is just a plain number, 42, it's a, it's a ratio, so it's unitless, um, if you think back to your math and high school chemistry days. Um, so just as a reference, 30, a, a number of 30, an S over T for 30, is like a really highly unmodified malt, is a really poorly modified malt. 50 is a super high, <laughs> super highly modified malt. Yep. In fact, mm. not, not really um, brewing malt. That's like distiller's malt. It would be 50 plus. Yep. Um, a, lot of, a lot of soluble protein. What is soluble protein? It's the enzymes that once it's in water, will unleash and be able to do what they need to do. Yep. So 42 is a, pr this number here, 42, is right in the middle of, that's still really strongly modified. Yep. Yep. Um, the next two numbers, which are interesting to talk about, we'll, we'll jump first to um, diastatic power, which is degrees Lintner, is what that is. So 140 is what's being reported here. In general, so what that, what that relates to is how much enzymatic activity does the malt have to converting starches. Um, in general, it's, a, it's accepted that for a normal single infusion mash, you want to have a total degrees Lintner of about 50. Okay. So where does this number come in play? For instance, if you were going to use this brewer's malt at 140, and in a recipe, you were going to go 50-50, let's say you want to make a Hefeweizen, 50-50 of this malt <coughs> and 50% unmalted wheat. Yeah. Or any non-enzymatically capable adjunct. It could be crystal malt. It could be whatever. Black patent. All those malts. If you were to go 50-50, the amount of Lintner, the amount of diastatic power you have now in your mash, is half that. Right? 70, which is still above 50. The closer you get to 50, it's still doable. Think, for instance, um, uh, like Munich 10 usually has a diastatic power, power of about... 50 to 60, maybe 70. But if you, so if you wanted to make a Munich, a full <laughs> Munich Dunkel beer, yeah. where you used all Munich malt, and maybe a little bit of coloring malt, you could potentially be pushing that Lintner down to 50. And all that means is your mashing probably is going to take more time. At a, at, at a, at a diastatic power of 50, you might be pushing yourself to needing definitely more than an hour of, of mash at low temperature too. So, um, that brings us up to alpha amylase. This is listed at 72. I don't remember exactly what the units are. Of, of, that's not a percentage. It's just how much alpha amylase power there is. Um, alpha amylase is looked at as being, is the one that clips from, uh, slashes up all the branches. That's and allows, an enzyme, right? It's yeah. an enzyme. It, so alpha amylase and beta amylase are the two primary enzymes taking big starch molecules and making them into sugars. Sugars. Mm -hmm. Starch is just a big chain of sugars, and those chains are branched as well. Beta amylase can only work from the ends, and when it hits a branch point, it doesn't know what to do. Hence, alpha amylase comes in and uh, breaks up the chains. So when you see a uh, diet, so here's an interesting thing too. Remember from all of your brewing books and all this um, accepted knowledge base, that like, how do you adjust like fermentability in mouth feels with mash temperature, right? The modern day malts at 140 degrees Lintner completely convert in about 20 minutes and they have so much alpha amylase power in them that no degree of temperatures, it's like turning a knob with nothing behind it. Hmm. So I've noticed in my brewing, right, that it almost doesn't matter whether you mash in at 158 or you mash in at 142, you sort of get the same output on the FG, pretty close. The only thing that changes it, if you were to be fair about it, is the other types of grains you put in there, meaning non-enzyme capable adjuncts. Got it. Will, can change your fermentability. So adding in a lot more crystal malt tends to give you a higher FG. Not because um, you played with the mash temp, you might very well do that, but it really has to do with how much, how much diastatic and alpha enzyme power you have to do it. So um, that's a really interesting thing to note there is that most of these malts are super, super able to convert. You just get them wet and they start converting and your mash temp almost really doesn't matter. I challenge anybody to just start playing with that reality. Take your favorite recipe that you've been brewing at 154 for years and mash it at 148 and you're probably going to be hard pressed to see a difference in the beer because of these industrialized malts. It's definitely true that these enzymes work at different temperatures and do different things. But these enzymes get away from you so fast that 
um, remember, di di uh, diastatic power accounts for beta and alpha amylase. Mm. It's not, right? So there's just so much enzymatic activity in the modern day malt that you don't have it. Now, that being said, my knowledge base is based on everything I learned about malt, say, 10, 12, 15 years ago. But there's a lot more craft malting going on where you might see these numbers be a little bit lower, which actually allows you to use some of those other levers in your mash regime or your liquor to grist ratio, which has zero influence on beer today mm -hmm. because of how convertible these malts are. Um, but a lot of great specialty malts are coming out. I don't mean specialty like flavor, just even those really good um, craft base malts yeah, have, have more effect here. Small maltsters across the country. Yep. yep. And um, so the last piece is color. This is coming in at 2 SRM color. I don't need to explain that. This is SRM. So as homebrewers, we can relate to that. Thank yep. God it's not EBC or something. Yep. Um, so anyway, um, moisture, you want to keep an eye on moisture. So uh, what do you do with all this information? As a home brewer, the only thing you really care about is extract and how much sugar we're going to get out of a pound of malt. And then the other thing, too, is uh, maybe a little bit you want to think about moisture because moisture is what causes malt to go slack. They call it going slack. So hmm. if you have malt that the malt, when you bite into a piece of malt, it should be somewhat crunchy. If it just sort of fades as you bite into it, if it doesn't really give you much resistance, um, it's probably picked up more moisture. And malt will naturally slowly equilibrate in a high moisture environment like if you live in the south in the summertime super humid it gets pretty humid here you want to keep your malt in a pl in a plastic really well sealed bag um, you want to keep it as airtight as possible so it's not absorbing moisture from a humid environment but the best way to test for that at home is to just taste it before you brew it and if it's getting soft it's probably losing um, it's picking up too much moisture yeah. which will throw off your efficiencies a little bit actually because yep. you're going to weigh it out and think you have a certain amount but you don't um, and then the last little pit, uh, bit of that is um, always get your malt. It really pays to have a mill at home. Or if you're going to crush at the homebrew store, use it fast. <laughs> do it in a way that you're doing it and bring it home. If it's a super humid time of year, you definitely don't want to be letting, because now you've exposed all that starch and endosperm to air, and it's going to absorb moisture even faster. The yep. husk does a really good job of protecting, Mother Nature does a really good job of protecting those kernels. So. Uh, anyway, that's like a whirlwind yeah. tour of, of looking at a malt analysis sheet. And it's all about the extract, uh, the dry basis, and moisture just in your home brewing practice yeah. because that can, those, those two numbers can really affect um, the outcome. What of you're the expecting beer. to get. But as a right. home brewer, you know, if you're trying to brew a 1054 beer and it comes in at 1051, Jumping on the forums and being like, what happened? It's probably, you know, you, you, I bet there's probably more error in your measurement uh, accuracy tools than there are in, in, the, in, itself, in the actual yeah. process. Yeah. And one more thing about extract is you might actually see this is dry basis. Sometimes you might actually see it listed as is, uh -huh. which is accounts for the moisture at the time of, of whatever. The check. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, that, I hope, was very informative. Um, there's definitely a lot of information on these product information sheets that come along with your malt. So uh, hopefully that helps you to understand what the uh, stats are saying and how you can use them. Uh, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel. We do this kind of thing every single week. For John and Mike, brew-news.com, have, have some beer. No oh, thanks. Brew on. Cheers. <laughs>